afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Oli Jansen. I'm the Commercial Director at Remedium Partners. Um, we're privileged to be joined by Dr. Ian Wilson, um, who was one of the, the lead um, for the project that we performed with Mid-Yorkshire. And um, we have designed this webinar um, for NHS Trust to learn more about the process and international recruitment in general. We will be doing a, a Q&A uh, at the end of the session and Ian has got some slides that we are going to run through to constitute the start of the webinar. So if we could hold questions to the end, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks, Holly, for uh, for that introduction. I'm, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Um, Zoom is still a bit of a mystery to me. I, I, I know we're all kind of living off uh, Teams and stuff at the moment, but it remains something of a mystery. To, if you flick back, Holly, just to begin with, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, something of a mystery to me. So uh, if you've managed to find the, the chat function, which I think if you wobble your uh, arrow at the bottom of the screen um, uh, 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 on your computers, there's a chat thing and it'll open a little box. I have got it open, but being um, male, I, I'm rubbish at multitasking, um, but I will try and keep an eye. So if uh, people can't hear or there's something that uh, leaps to mind, I'm very happy for you to put it into the chat. I probably won't pause to uh, answer questions as we go along uh, and uh, try and save them for the end. Um, but it might well be worth your while popping a question in the chat, because if it becomes opportunistic for me to try and address it as I go along, I'll, I'll absolutely have a go at that. Um, but it also just makes sure that you've uh, captured the question as well. So do, do feel free to do that. Don't be inhibited. I suspect nobody will be inhibited, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, OK, so my name's Ian Wilson. I'm a, a Deputy Chief Medical Officer or Deputy Medical Director, however you want to do it, at Mid-Yorkshire Teaching Trust. Um, I've been doing this job now for probably about 15 years on and off and various other things as well. And I cover the workforce and professional standards portfolio. I'm also Caldecott Guardian. So, so my job is the one where people dive down corridors in order to avoid speaking to me because I'm either going to give them a job or tell them they've not been doing their job properly or bore them to death on information governance. Um, but uh, so, so that's my, my role. But uh, I've got involved um, with the alternative models of recruitment over some time. Yes, we've had the uh, partnership with the uh, consultants for Remedium, but I've also been involved in the past with uh, the, the medical workforce function nationally um, through work I used to do with the uh, British Medical Association and um, with the uh, uh, Health Education England as it was um, and Department of Health Workforce Planning um, and, and the various uh, efforts that have, have gone on there. So I've, I've got background and, and insight. Um, so it's been interesting having to go onto the sharp end of it where um, I'm actually having to put my, uh, well, other people's money where, where my mouth has been in order to, uh, uh, to, to work out how to recruit in a very difficult environment. If you could move on, please, Ol. Um, what I've tried to do, and, and there aren't too many slides here, I promise you, I think there's... Uh, what, eight or I think there's nine or ten slides. Um, I've split it into a little bit of an introduction for the, the background, most of which will talk about the local dimension. Uh, and I've, I've set that out because I think it's important you see what our local situation was, because how you view what we did um, will be affected and coloured by what your own local dimension is, because you need to see the thoughts and suggestions and ideas we've developed here in through the lens of your own uh, uh, your own circumstances. So, so that's there for a reason. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to call it round one, uh, our first go at uh, an international recruitment uh, opportunity. And then I'm going to come into how we started to think differently um, and, and our round two which actually came quite a lot of crossover between the two. Um, and I did, I think it's appropriate for someone in the, these kind of circumstances to make clear that I, I don't have any competing interests. Uh, I don't receive any payment uh, either in cash or kind or anything. I think, I think Remedium bought me a drink while we were out in India, that kind of thing. But there's um, no financial or share dealing or anything else interest in, uh, in the Remedium company otherwise. Uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, what I'm going to say are my views um, and I'll talk very happily about how things worked really well with the partnership that we have with Remedium. Um, I'm also happy to talk about where things could be different um, uh, because I think that's important because we all learn from that. It's it's not a, 
a, a, a, a transactional relationship. Um, next slide, please. So in, in news that will surprise nobody um, uh, whatsoever, and particularly on a day like today where we're celebrating uh, 75 years of the Windrush uh, uh, migration, um, it's clear to say international graduates coming into the NHS is nothing new. Um, the NHS has relied upon uh, uh, migration ever since it started. And as I mentioned, the Windrush changes and the Windrush migration, um, setting aside some of the awful things that happened as, uh, within that, uh, we have been hugely reliant on um, uh, diversity from all over the globe. Um, it, it, in that case, it was migration from the West Indies, but uh, we'll all be very used to um, substantial migrations from South Asia, from Southeast Asia and, and elsewhere. Um, increase, well, there was a period of increased migration from within Europe, but that has sort of ebbed and flowed. And I think it's probably a bit static at the moment. But the point there that it, going out to recruit internationally is absolutely nothing new at all. Uh, and the reality is demand for services has always outgrown uh, the local supply and the numbers of people graduating, notwithstanding a very significant increase in the uh, uh, graduating medical student um, cohorts over the last 20 years uh, and projected significant increase uh, currently. It, the, the demand seems to go up faster than uh, any efforts to graduate people under the, the sort of homegrown circumstances. So. It's been an active process to bring people in from overseas, but there's also just been the, the ebb and flow of migration, which has happened since time immemorial. Um, and people will arrive in the UK and want to practice in the UK or train in the UK. So again, nothing new, but there's also uh, a number of training and development programs which were set up to encourage uh, training from people for, with people from uh, other cultures and other countries on either a reciprocal basis or, or a one-way basis. And different colleges, different rural colleges have uh, uh, pushed those in different ways at, at different times. The thing is, it's been typically, typically, not exclusively, passive recruitment, by which I mean we stick an advert in the British Medical Journal and we see who applies, or we stick an advert in an overseas medical journal if we're really going to uh, push it and we see who applies. Uh, or very occasionally, and usually at great expense, we'll get a, an international recruitment agent to uh, to go out and find us somebody. Um, but again, it's we've set the job. This is what we want. This is the shape of that job. And we see who applies. And I'm sure those who've got some experience with this will be familiar with you putting a, a job out there and getting a very interesting selection of, of applicants um, who aren't necessarily medically qualified, aren't necessarily qualified in a particular specialty because the, 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 the culture of applications and the culture of uh, um, how systems work in other countries is, is, uh, is, is, is very different. Historically, people have come in with very limited support. Uh, I mean, going right back to Windrush, I think that that's true. Um, people arrive, they're popped into jobs, and uh, it's kind of, you know, crack on, do your best. Now, I know there are people uh, who put a great deal of effort into supporting people who've come from uh, uh, overseas, but I'm going historically and typically it's kind of turn up and do your best. And that's difficult for the individuals. It's difficult in terms of engagement and it's difficult in terms of retention or what I'm going to call uh, stickability. And again, over the history of uh, international recruitment, career progression opportunities have not always been clear. That's um probably euphemistic to say that. I think we've over decades had uh, differential career opportunities for people who've uh, been homegrown applicants and people who've been uh, overseas uh, graduates. So we, 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 it, it's created a, a culture within our services of um, um, not entirely equality of opportunity. Now, again, that has hopefully changed over time and different organisations will see this in, in a different way. But like many other trusts, we found we have a, a population here that's from very diverse ethnicity and a uh, workforce that's an extremely diverse ethnicity, uh, many of whom have been here for very long periods of time and have not necessarily uh, progressed easily through the system, uh, depending on where they've come from and 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 how they've got into the system. Next slide, please. So that was a very general uh, background. And again, blinding flash of the blinking obvious, but um, uh, here's our local uh, uh, situation that we 
uh, everywhere, I would say, is underprovided for by national training number trainees, by which I mean deanery trainees or however you want to put it. Um, but uh, those people that are UK formal training programmes tend to uh, not fill all the jobs that we, we need to do. And there's, there's, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, locally, uh, we find that Mid Yorkshire, despite having just become a teaching trust, Mid Yorkshire gets a third of the number of NTN trainees compared to the uh, local university uh, establishment. And that's something that um, we highlight, but it means we're severely underdoctored. And of course, there are certain specialties that are uh, uh, harder to recruit into than others and certain that are more challenged um, than others. We have gaps at all tiers in all specialties all the time. Now, it may only be the odd gap that uh, uh, comes as a result of sickness or maternity leave or the various other reasons people might be um, off uh, from the, the, the middle tiers or the senior tiers. Um, but we also have quite a number of almost designed in gaps, uh, which I've called their fixed gaps, uh, because we just have more spaces on a rotor than people that come in. And they're there all the time and we're, we'd be using uh, locums or itinerant workforce for it all the time. So our fixed gaps had started to become more than our occasional sickness absence, uh, uh, maternity leave absence, jury service absence, all the reasons people might go, but they'd become more than that. And we were finding we had an up to 10% gap depending on the specialty. So some specialties we'd have very little and others we'd have, I don't know, a fifth of people absent. And that's a serious problem in terms of providing safe care apart from uh, good training uh, and, um, and all the other problems that most people on the call will be well aware of. Um, and of course, the other thing uh, is, and you'll all be experiencing this, the availability of the itinerant workforce locums uh, is very variable. There are certain parts of the country where it's, it's much easier than others, um, but the demand may change. And we had found that it was becoming harder and harder in, in our area um, for very many reasons. And again, that varied by specialty and certainly the hyperacute specialties or the very, very, uh, uh, well, let me think of things like the clinical hematology type specialties, it's impossible to recruit to anywhere, but particularly in our area. So we had real challenges there. Um, and again, great difficulty in sustaining a workforce and, and safe patient care or in, indeed any kind of service in some areas. And of course, uh, whilst we have some absolutely fantastic locums, uh, and we really do, there's um, the variability in quality and in governance is, is more obvious in our, our locum, our itinerant workforce, and causes the likes of me a little bit nervousness when you're not completely sure who's coming, you're not completely sure about the induction they're getting, the support they're getting, um, and how well they're going to be able to perform or how well um, they would perform even if all the support was in place. So I, I think, you know, there's there's it's possible to manage that when you're talking about a small number of people. Uh, when you're talking about a workforce of 10% being itinerant or more, then that becomes a significant quality problem. And it's something that the colleges, the GMC um, and the deaneries and indeed the Care Quality Commission start to take seriously. Now, all of these things, um, they impact on my life, they impact on our medical workforce uh, functions uh, lives, but they impact on um, uh, the, the, the workforce that you've got, your, your substantive workforce as well, um, both in terms of uh, uh, quality, safety and experience, but in terms of those people's well-being too. So even if you fill the gaps with a lot of locums, it has an impact where you can't fill them. Clearly, that has a, a, a serious well-being implication and that will be reflected back in deanery surveys, HE surveys and GMC surveys and it's no surprise to anybody that somewhere like Mid Yorkshire was really struggling on our GMC surveys. Um, quite hard to, if you've looked at GMC surveys, they're quite hard to analyse sometimes but we were performing very badly uh, in, in some areas and it almost all mapped across to where we had uh, workforce gaps or where the job was just so, so busy that even if we were full, the uh, the, the numbers of people um, needed outstripped the numbers we actually had even on a, on a full complement. So we could satisfy ourselves we were not doing a bad job in terms of training, but simply trainees weren't getting the time to train 
um, because they were all always covering or always working because of being under doctored. Um, next bullet on that one is the road ahead and the coming storm. And again, that's it's the difficulties of workforce planning. We we can see that some specialties are really struggling to recruit, and despite the best efforts of uh, colleges and societies, uh, it's just the truth that in some specialties there are there's considerably more projected demand than there are people coming through the training schemes. Um, that uh, the government has addressed in some areas, such as in general practice, uh, not completely but they've made efforts to address it but that itself will mean uh, stripping out some of the uh, ability to recruit into hospitals and again certain specialties is very very difficult to get people to get into training let alone get them through the training and out the other side so it's worth looking ahead to see who's coming off the training scheme and um, uh, and, and what you've got coming down the road and it's probably worth thinking in some of the thinking differently that i'm going to talk about uh, it may be worth planning ahead and, and buying now for something that you might need later and that that's quite a difficult concept to get but you know while there are people out there get them for example locally um we actually have a little bit of a bubble of uh, anaesthetists just at the moment but we know down the line it's going to dip down and uh, it's probably worth our while recruiting while there are people out there to recruit now all of this all of these problems all of these challenges have a significant qualitative cost. I mentioned that earlier, but it also costs cash. And we were spending an absolute fortune on, on locums, uh, uh, you know, a massive outlier in the, in the cost of locums. And of course, of late, um, locum rates have spiraled um, to some extent driven by the publication of, um, uh, of rate cards and suggested rates, but they were spiraling anyway. And it's not unusual for us to get uh, uh, stuck uh, with uh, requests for, I don't know, £200 an hour um, for senior people. It's not that unusual for us to be being asked for £90, £100 an hour for um, uh, even the most junior tiers, uh, because that's what they can do. And whilst we operate a very, very tight ship in mid-Yorkshire for our locum costs, and we really do operate a tight ship, not everybody else locally um, uh, operates such a, a stringent approach, and that ends up driving costs up and our other local dimension is despite all the problems we've got we put a huge amount of effort into trying to be a really great place to work uh, and actually we are a really great place to work um we have taken the journey and and indeed crossed the 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 the, the rubicon the river whatever that is to uh, uh, teaching trust status and we've aspirations to move towards university st trust status but it's not just about the label there is something about really wanting to be the best place to work and like many of you we have some areas that people will tell us one department is is the absolute best place in yorkshire to work uh, and other departments where uh, maybe not quite so popular uh, what we do do very well is we always top the polls in uh, how our students um, see us so people want to apply early on in their careers whether whether after they've worked with us a bit because it's so so busy whether that's uh, uh, sustained is, is another matter uh, next slide please ollie so that's the background and it's why we decided in 2020 or just before 2020 to uh, uh, put together a project with uh, our partners Remedium as consultants to go out to Mumbai and dip our toe into the water of international recruitment done in a slightly different way. So actually go out and, uh, and, and see what we could, uh, we could recruit rather than just stick an advert in, in the, uh, the medical press and see what happened. And we kept it reasonably small scale. Uh, we did it in areas where it was still financially worthwhile, but we worked on ED and uh, radiology um, to begin with. And we made a plan for going out for eight to 10 middle tier, shouldn't say middle grade, middle tier uh, doctors with a little bit of flexibility. Um, and because of the uh, uh, the quality of the people that uh, the first team that we deployed met, we actually recruited uh, 13 people, so a little above our plan. Um, and you can see there 10 for uh, uh, emergency medicine um, at uh, middle tier, uh, two SHOs and a radiology consultant. And that radiology consultant has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, and uh, well, I'll tell the story about how, where that took us afterwards. But it was still a fairly traditional model. So although we weren't just sticking an advert in the paper, it was still, this is what we want. This is the shape. I keep showing these shapes, but it'll make sense in a little while. This is the 
the, the, the shape of what we want. This is the number of people we want. This is the job we want them to do. Um, so let's see what we can get. Now, on the market um, showed that it had slightly different ideas. So there was a slight imbalance between what we thought we wanted in a traditional UK um, standards driven, um, well, by standards, I mean, the shape, the size and the format of the workforce, not the quality. Uh, the market had a slightly different idea to that. Next slide, please. It was nevertheless successful, but we came back and had a little rethink and thought this, this has worked. It has been worthwhile. Um, it's worked in our emergency department. We've got some great people over here. They're working, they're uh, sticking with us, but it might be time to think just a little bit differently. And instead of saying, right, this is the standard shape of the grade we want, the type of person we want, the expectations we want, and if you don't fulfill all the criteria you're out, that sort of binary in out, maybe we look at our role profiles and we take some of the things that are in the essentials and say, actually, do they have to be in the essentials column? What could we take over to the desirable? And what could we even create a third column saying, you know, flex the areas we could be flexible? Um, so we we did look at yeah, what we want, what we need in the traditional model, and then say, okay, if we can't quite fit that precise model, what could we offer? What could we accommodate? We're keen to recruit people. We've got a need. I wouldn't go as far as saying we're desperate, but we are um, challenged in certain areas. What could we offer people that's going to make them think, do you know what, it's really worth leaving our homes and our families from and traveling halfway across the world to uh, to go and work in, in Yorkshire now, apart from the fact that it's Yorkshire and just therefore fabulous. Um, it, the, the, you need to have a little bit more to offer people. And that might be uh, roles and jobs for partner spouses, schools and accommodation, uh, all of that kind of thing. Where are the gaps that would, would help people come, come across? And we, we found some interesting things out as soft intel, which we'll maybe touch on later. But all of that then had to be balanced by what's the market got? What is out there? And we may touch on this later, but there are certain specialties that even the, the consultancies can't find for you. They'll, some consultancies will promise the earth. You know, I, I've lost count of the number of people that send me emails saying we've got a dermatologist ready to come and work with you. But when you really get into it, no, they haven't. And they're not out there. And, and we may touch on this when Ollie comes in later about just using dermatology as an example, because we had a, an interesting discussion where something didn't work quite so well, despite finding what the market had available to us. But that might be a good example, Ollie, if you just make a note to use that one later, perhaps. But we also said, despite that, we were still going to recruit based on the quality of our applicants, not just we've got to fill a row to we'll take anybody. And those involved in recruitment will be quite used to the idea of, you know, we're absolutely desperate. We've got to fill a gap in the rota. They've got two arms, two legs and a head. Let's just get them in there. And if you've been around a while, you'll know that, that, that quite a lot of the time that comes back to bite you. So we we did really focus on if we've got the right quality of applicant, then that's what will drive whether or not uh, we, we offer them a job. But we, that worked a little in the other balance as well, because we actually found we had more applicants of really good quality than we necessarily had gaps on our rotors. So we then had, well, great position to be in to be able to turn some people down. But actually, why don't we have a think about this? Why don't we think could we do something different? Could we use them in a different way? Can we have a chat with with somebody? And we've got, we, we did things differently on our second round, as I'll come to, but we've also got ideas for the future. Um, and a lot of that was about bringing people in to grow our own consultants, if you like, to bring people in to jobs where we wouldn't just stick them in rotors. We would put them in uh, what are essentially training jobs, although they're not NTN, national training number training jobs, but that was part of the attraction that we brought people on in on the right terms and conditions of service and we'll train them and develop them so that in the future we, we start to grow our own workforce because the workforce isn't always there. My third bullet about taking opportunities and being opportunistic goes right back to uh, when we have really good applicants and really good opportunities. I'd ring back and have a conversation with somebody perhaps, but we went out there with the specific intent of being opportunistic if we found people that we hadn't got on our business plan and having a plan where we could call back to the headquarters and have somebody, a decision maker, where we could flex the, the, the business plan we'd gone out with. Because again, the market threw up different things to our standard model. If we could have the next slide, please. 
So round two was based on all of that. We had a very detailed set of briefings with uh, with Remedium uh, on all of those matters. You know, what is our need? What's the market? And what are the opportunity? And that briefing is essential. And if anybody goes down this route, either with Remedium or with any other organization, spending that time is worth its weight in gold. It's not a matter of we need five ophthalmologists who look like this. It's It's actually sitting down and saying, right, here's what our trust is like here's what our needs are here's what our department's like here's the culture within our department here's the sorts of things we're going to expect off people and i'll come back to why in a minute and they know the market and other recruitment consultancies and so on but they know the market and they know the opportunities there so by that detailed i've said briefing but it was a series of uh, uh, engagements um that we, we we got we got as near as it was possible to to to, to get to a shared objective of course some great successes and some where we, we've learned for the future. Um, but I mentioned that we, we went out there with a little bit of flexibility in what we were going to go and recruit to and a governance process so that if something happened and there was an opportunity, despite being, I don't know, eight, 10 hour time difference, I was able to call back to the uh, director of operations. And instead of having a long and complex meeting, we would have a sort of a, a, a series of check boxes to check we were making a sensible decision and they would have the discussions back here to say right well you've got an opportunity let's take it let's take the risk and we all understood before the recruitment team went out there that there were certain risks uh, that were worth taking but how risk averse and how risk accepting were we going to be so all of that briefing um uh, fed into the pre-screening of the candidates and that was what uh, consultancy remedium did uh, for us. And that, I'm going to maybe say this a few times, if there's one thing that makes that process stand out and using company can do this, it's that. I'll probably say that a few times about different things, but for that, for the moment, that pre-screening made a massive difference. And that ability to understand what we were after and to know us made a massive difference. And that time spent with them so that they did properly know us, as far as is possible, made a massive difference. So we were able to eliminate what I put on there is called applicant remorse. So a, a number of people were filtered out who just weren't actually going to um, turn up if we we appointed them. Not unusual for an interview to happen, an offer to be made, a lot of negotiations, and then at the last minute, an applicant pulls out because they weren't really serious. They were testing the water. They just fancied the interview, any of those things. But the pre-screening actually started a lot of focus on that. So by the time we got to interview, there were incredibly few people we got to see that we sat and thought, why on earth did that person even get as far as us? Of course, there were people we chose we, that weren't right for us, but it was minuscule numbers that we got to saying, how did that person even get to us? Very thoroughly done. So that the quality was screened, the attitude towards moving was screened, the ability to move. So, you know, um, uh, the ability to migrate was, was checked. And they had clarity on our offer. So they knew when we were doing something that was a bit unusual or we were um, haggling a bit over contractual terms, which we like to do because we're slightly obsessive about doing things by the book uh, up here. Um, Remedium were able to give absolute clarity on what it was that we were offering and why, and often answer questions without um, us having to do it. So a huge part of the work was done for us. So the second um, uh, uh, trip out actually took us to two centres. We went to Mumbai again, but we also went to Kerala, where the uh, emergency medicine conference, excuse me, the emergency medicine conference was on. Uh, and that actually took us in a, a whole different area that, that may um, reap potential over time um, and put our name out there and, and actually got us noticed as a trust that's not a big London teaching uh, research trust, but um, we were in a major conference that uh, the name got noticed and that, that's important. And we went out with, with eight specialties, which uh, are listed there with a plan for recruiting 42 doctors. That's quite an ask over the period of time that we were there and it was busy. Of course, we had a lovely time out there, but my goodness, we worked for it. Ollie, do you want to... Uh, pass on there because we were uh, interviewing at pace um, quickly uh, and simultaneously. And with me being out there for uh, for the MD's office, it was, uh, it was quite a lot of oversight to do. So we went out there and, and certainly people will be asking, well, why did you go out? What did you know? Why didn't you do it over over Teams? So uh, you know, did we want to go out there on Microsoft Teams or Team Mid-Yorks? Well, I think 
I'd be surprised if many people would say that they get a better interview over Teams than they get face to face. You're on the other side of the world in a different cultural environment with a different approach to being interviewed and to interviewing. And actually, we found demonstrably better interviews by being there. Now, we, insofar as you can test that hypothesis um, there were a number of interviews where I was there in the room and we had a, a couple of the specialists because we didn't take everybody out we did the specialty element of the interview remotely and it was fascinating to talk to my colleagues afterwards and it, it crystallized some of my thinking um, as to how they saw and were able to adapt their questioning when they were doing this remotely over teams whereas I was in the room and able to adapt my questioning and my thinking and have a conversation with a, a real human being. So the nonverbal cues, the human interactions, the observations you could make, and I may tell a story about them in a little while, the check and challenge you could put in was infinitely better being in the room. And of course, you didn't get a collapse of the IT. Um, uh, it's, it, you, you could actually have an interview. It also, I think, showed commitment on our part, because of course, people have come to us wanting to uh, I uh, uh, wanted to get a job, but you know what? We need them just as much as they need us. And I think there's something quite important about showing that commitment. You're prepared to go out there. You're prepared to take a team. And, you know, they weren't all people who were working in Mumbai. These, there were people who'd flown several hours across India to uh, to come to Mumbai or come to Kerala uh, to, to, uh, to talk to us. And I think there was something about the respect of having a team there, quite apart from the fact that you got a, a, a real conversation uh, with people and of course we met people we met them on a human level and i think that made a difference in terms of the stickability and the transference into actually joining us and coming over and i've met a few people well I've met everybody but uh, uh, i've met people in corridors who've remembered that conversation and it's, it's a much more positive experience and and of course the adaptability bullet that i put on there is you can change your questioning you can change your approach and i did that a lot because my views started to develop and my approach to uh, recruitment started to develop in the, the the context of seeing how our new approach was actually happening and applying so when i rang back to our senior management team to say i've got an opportunity here ent ophthalmology dermatology um cardiology actually uh, although we hadn't gone out for that an opportunity came up you're in the room you, you you know what you're dealing with and you can have a much richer conversation to say to somebody I need you to write me a check because we've got a real opportunity here. So who did we take out? Well, myself as part of the, the MD's office and I was there. Uh, well, we had some consultant interviews, so we needed somebody from the MD's office there. But I was there as the sort of clinical decision maker, if you like, but also our, our senior manager to uh, similarly make the um, difficult decisions where we had to, particularly on the uh, getting other people, uh, getting additional people in. Uh, we took our medical staffing manager, and we had a combination of specialty leads for the the specialties where we were take where we were recruiting in the largest numbers. So our ED, our acute medicine, uh, gynecology and obstetrics, and some anaesthesia. I think that was it. Can't remember now. Um, but we also kept some leads at back at base. So uh, our our specialty leads weren't all the heads of clinical service. So obviously we needed a link back to base and a time when we could contact people. But we also had the base teams for paediatrics and, and others who we still had to do some remote work. And it kind of worked having the hybrid, someone in the room and somebody remote, um, and certainly was better than uh, uh, doing it all uh, remotely. Um, but I think it was better to, to have folks in the room and particularly um, you know, when we were rejecting people, um, that rejection was much more confident and, and easier to do when you're in the room. And absolutely crucially, absolutely crucially, alongside my remarks about the pre-screening, was having the, uh, um, in this case, the remedium leads on site and with us. And that wasn't just about the sort of processing, the checking in of the people, making sure all the documents were ready, making sure we had the materials that we, we needed when we needed it. Um, uh, the venue site and all the rest of it uh, were, were done by the uh, uh, the consultancy team. Um, but it was also, we used them on a couple of occasions where we just wanted to understand a difficult interview we'd had, where uh, we couldn't quite decide certain things. But having local, but both the UK team that came out with us, but also the local uh, uh, management team made a, a really big difference because they had 
the cultural nous, the cultural um, lived experience, that we could try and understand things a bit better. And that worked both for including people that we were uneasy about, but also excluding on, on a couple of occasions. That, that was absolutely crucial in my view. Um, next slide, please. And I'll speed up a little bit there. Of course, you've then got to get people back to the UK. And part of that reason I keep going on about being in the room is, is the the loyalty factor, you should never underestimate the loyalty factor that uh, we treated people really well. And they were going to be, I'm going, somebody's just mentioned the attrition rate. Good, good point to mention that. Um, uh, that loyalty factor was, was, I think, quite important. Of course, you can't say for certain, but you get an instinct for these things. Slightly tenuously jumping across to another thing about the loyalty factor. We've got people that have been recruited through the first round of this route who've come, worked with us, liked us, been treated well by us, and we've put the extra effort in, who've phoned a friend, and then they've come and said to us, we'd like to come and work with you as well. And there's been a sort of next steps uh, cycle. So we've actually almost, almost started to get a little bit of a pipeline in some specialties where people have told, uh, told a mate. In fact, we had that happen with one of the specialties in the room. We appointed somebody to a, one specialty, and by the end of the day, they said, I've got a friend. I really like what you're trying to do here. You're clearly bothered about what you're doing. Can they come and talk to you? And, and we, we, we set those things in motion. But that stickability is also helped by treating people properly in, in a general way and also training people. Because as I've said, they've come home as, as, as trust doctors, but we're, we're, we're training them. We're giving them um, those opportunities. Um, and that creates a quality gain all the way through. And that quality improves quality, safety and patient experience. So you get the financial gain and the quality gain as we go along. If you can give me the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, I will sort of touch on the, the attrition rate um, uh, as I go along, um, because, of course, there's a little bit of one. Um, so we went out with a plan to recruit 42 doctors. We made 54 offers. That was the quality of what we had and the, uh, the I suppose, how robust our at base governance process was there and of those 40 of those 54 46 have arrived and are in work at the moment um and six are still to come and it's uh ollie will probably tell you where the uh challenges are but uh, six are still to come from a november recruitment which is an attrition of just two which is what that would be four percent have i done the math i'm never great at math but that would be four percent i don't think that's bad i don't think that's bad and of those two remedium already working as part of the the package and the, the contract to replace those two people in a different way and we have interviews and things placed for that clearly we can't travel out there but we have uh, a, a moment uh, opportunities in place next slide please i think we're getting to the end so some people will like numbers um, and that's really important because it's it ain't cheap but it is good value so we will spend before the trip went out there 12 and a half million on the non-consultant uh, bank and agency locums prior to the tra trip so 12 and a half million a year we were spending on filling the gaps the cost of recruiting uh, those that the doctors that we recruited it's a really really tiny writing but the entire cost of everything so immigration sponsorship finders fees um the the training we had to do for uh, getting them up to speed with uh, electronic systems, with how to work in the NHS, which was all done um, at, at their base before they come. Relocation fees, pastoral care, and, and, the, and the costs of the trip going out. That entire package was one and a half million quid. So with some offset because of the quality gains and the stickability, and difficult to quantify but there's evidence to say if just one of our new middle tier doctors gets through caesar and gets a consultant appointment with us in a place we haven't got a consultant that would save us 150,000 pounds per annum so over relatively short period of time would actually save well 10 years there it would be it would save the cost of the entire trip just by having one person that's one trip gets more complicated than that but it's a useful way of thinking about why you'd be spending one and a half million to do this and of course when you look at the, the the salary costs over the lifetime of the two to three year contract that would be about nine million quid in salary costs so still adding it all up it's still a significant saving on the 12 and a half million of um uh, uh, locum costs so there is a a projected lifetime saving of up to 
and that we have put the top end in there. I think it ranges, I think it was, I can't remember whether it was nine million or 10 million at base, but up to 14 million pounds if we get all the things out of this and we get the stickability we want. I hope that's useful data, but that's us and we're a big place with a lot of challenges. The numbers would be different for you. Next slide, please. Would we do it again? That's the class question, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely in principle, we would clearly need um, to do the numbers again. But I think in terms of the, uh, the, the, the project itself, um, round one was something of a leap of faith. Um, but for most of our trust, it's not a leap of faith anymore. Of course, it's variable in, in, in different areas. And it's still a challenge for finance teams because those numbers look many years ahead. And many finance teams are looking to survive to the end of the week or at least to the, the end of the year or balance the budgets. And, and some finance teams find it very difficult to move things between budget lines. I, I kind of understand why, was what we did here was have the flexibility to move between budget lines to overspend sensibly with managed risk and i think it's fair to say that our different thinking which was and i'm doing the shape again if you go out there with a job like that that's that shape and you expect to find doctors who are that shape you ain't going to get them you go out there with a job that's that shape you'll find doctors who are maybe that shape now a little bit of lateral thinking here and visual thinking if you sort of trim the corners off a bit here and here and then maybe trim the corners off a bit there there and think what you could do you might actually find you've got shapes that fit together we've done a lot of that it's quite labor intensive and it does require a, a lot of commitment from leaders within uh, a service and within a department to, to to think differently because it takes a lot of effort is it worth it you bet it's worth it and we've got some people like i said they're driving recruitment for us now um and it, it's about it's about sensibly taking the opportunities you can where you've got really good people out there and, uh, and you know, moving forward by thinking a little bit differently. So we think now our different thinking is now moved on much more from, from being something odd or unusual and is much more of a business as usual to the point that in some specialties, I'm actually having to hold a few people back now. Now that's, I think that's our last slide, but uh, that was a very, very quick canter through what we did and why we did it. And um, possibly a little longer than I planned to do, Ollie, but I think you knew I would do that. Um, I only see one question that had come in the, the, the list, but um, I, I hope that's been helpful to people. Very, very happy to answer um, any other thoughts or questions that people have got now. Um, or indeed, if you want to think about them and come back to us at another time, that would be fine too. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Ian. It, it definitely was great to, to hear you. And it really is great to, to think back of all the work the trust and ourselves put in to, to get to the point we are today. Um, I'll just fire through one of the simple questions. Will the presentation be shared later? Yes, um, everyone who signed up will receive a copy of the uh, presentation um, as well as the recording uh, of, of um, your, you speaking today. Um, we had a question uh, which I can probably help with as well um, from Jamie in terms of attrition rate and loss of recruits to train and post at 12 months. Um, so I think really, um, and specific to EM, so it, it's really helpful to draw back on the first trip. And it was the big evidence base, as, as you kind of alluded to, as to why Remedium could be selected again to support you with a second round and why a second round should really um, focus on all specialties. So I'm delighted to say, you know, the, the doctors that were recruited in, in ED, whether they were SHOs or, or middle tier, um, all stayed beyond the initial 12 months, the vast majority of which are still in post um, some three and a half to four years on. Um, going through the, the CESA programme that Dr. Robert Shaw in your uh, emergency division has worked really hard to build out, and a couple uh, of which have entered into regional or, or national higher training posts as well over the years, but all of them um, completed the initially offered three-year contract with the Trust, which is a, a massive badge of honour for how the process worked, but also how the, those doctors in emergency medicine were treated. Uh, upon arrival. I think if I'm correct as well, the two SHOs went into GP training, which was they were hired in full knowledge of that was the skills um, that they were looking to, to get at SD12 level uh, and then were successful uh, after two years in post of, of achieving that. 
Um, so Jamie, hopefully that answers that for you as well. Can I just uh, add to that, Ollie? The, I mean, ED, emergency medicine is a, a slightly different scenario to a lot of the specialties that uh, we recruit because I think emergency medicine is uh, extremely well established in, in India and on, on a very similar model to the UK. Their exams are, are similar, their curriculum's quite similar, or, although it was fascinating to hear some of the differences in the pathology uh, people saw. Um, but one of the things that it was on my slide, but I didn't really uh, dwell on it, whilst we've put a lot of effort in, and particularly in emergency medicine, put a lot of effort into making people feel um, loved, um, cared for, trained, educated, and, and really supported, despite the fact that we're the third busiest ED in the country for um, compared to our population. Uh, the, the 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 red carpeting package was so important. Uh, that's the the uh, the training before people came, but also the support when they're here, making sure there was somebody to call. Um, actually, not us, although we put the uh, the the arrangements in with educational supervisors and so on. But somebody from a consultancy from Remedium to call about things where they weren't quite sure about talking to the consultant because culturally it's a different um, relationship of, uh, in India. Um, but also simple things like, you know, how do you post a letter? How do you get a bank account organized? Um, you know, where do your kids organize to go to school? All of those things, uh, getting a place to live. All of that was, uh, we, we get feedback and actually I haven't told you this, Ollie, but somebody called us the other day um, uh, just saying that, that the, the, the red carpeting package had been absolutely superb. So good to hear. Nice forum to hear it as well. Um, so we had delegates from Great, Great Western again looking at emergency medicine. How much this, does this require finance to release up front? Um, so that that is one that if you contact me via email, I can I can share. We would need a breakdown of the numbers and your aspirational hires. We're bound by our framework terms and conditions that have a mandatory kind of ceiling rate to them. Um, the more hires that an organisation would look to make with us the more economies of scale are built into that. So that's something that we could certainly take offline. Um, if other individuals have further questions as well, we will be providing details for further questions uh, via emails and meetings with ourselves afterwards as well. Um, there is Zoe Parks has asked, and um, he talked about the cost of the project being 1.5 million. Is a large proportion of that the relocation packages and expenses? Ian, would you like to start? I have some some knowledge on the matter as well. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm going to do the doctor thing. I don't do the money. <laughs> Somebody else deals with the money. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, broadly, the trip was a, a relatively small um, part of that. The trip was somewhere around uh, seventy thousand pounds in 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 all for quite a big going out there um the cost of recruiting uh, was if i remember rightly about a million um and that included um uh, immigration sponsorship finders fees training relocation and pastoral care the actual relocation i, I honestly don't know the the, the answer to that ollie so, could you yeah so mid yorkshire worked really closely with us on this it was your colleague uh, ian carr and I who sat down, um, they asked Remedium to, to do some market research as to the main desirables uh, for a relocating doctor. Um, and where, uh, before working with us, you had a relocation package of um, 8,000 pounds. By hitting the desirable criteria for the doctors, we reduced that down to 5,000 pounds per doctor, but we made sure that the policy was fit for purpose for, for the trip in, in general. So doctors who were successful and had attended your interviews and flown into interviews were, were reimbursed. Families uh, were permitted to, um, on visa applications and flights um, to the UK. So it was a, a package that was, um, you know, financially signed off, but really understood the process as well um, and was pleased to, to help the trust trim a little bit off their initial policy that perhaps would have been a bit more stringent around um, some of those things that are really desirable uh, to international doctors in, in the process. So it was £5,000 per doctor, in short, was the relocation package. Um, okay, we have... So, Julia. so that's, that's £3,000 less than we would have uh, given somebody if we'd recruited them on our own over uh, teams, interestingly. But yeah, okay. Julia has asked pastoral support. Um, I may, I may have touched a bit on that, um, Julia, already, and, and there's two sides, aren't there? There's the sort of pre-arrival and this, the support while people are here and um, 
uh, uh, what we put in place was to make sure that people had, uh, a, a, I suppose it's informally, but we did make sure there was some buddying um, available and that people were introduced to uh, uh, the department properly, a proper uh, new starter induction beyond the, 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 the normal induction um, and educational supervision personal supervision and support, as well as meeting people. Um, I think you may have seen on one of the, the pictures on one of the slides that we, we uh, Remedium put on a big meeting, sponsored a big meeting for us to put on where we got everybody together. Um, so there's that level of support and direct access to uh, MD's office, uh, myself and my um, management colleague Ian Carr. But I suspect what you're asking is about the red carpeting package, which Ollie's better able to, to answer. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, as Ian said, we have a digital relocation platform called Red Carpet. So that is um, Remedium's facilities to link candidate, trust um, and uh, Remedium together. Um, so once candidates accept their offer, they're uploaded into the platform. It starts with the basics of documentation collection to relieve that burden from the HR teams. Um, there are then, you know, a host of bespoke insights on, on the platform. So it helps with both temporary and permanent accommodation. One of the big um, assets of the, the platform that we use that candidates love is that there's access to an interest-free loan. Um, so gone are the days um, of doctors queuing um, or email queuing, asking for cash advances um, to support of all of the intricate um, financial burdens that um, candidates go through when relocating to the UK. Um, it also bears in mind um, this is a, you know, relocating is not just an individual, it is often, you know, a spouse um, and children. So the platform, um, which is bespoke to the, the region and the trust that the candidate is going to, um, also has local insights, um, you know, uh, stuff around schooling. Um, there may be um, other areas as well that are built out on the platform but that is our digital mechanism to pastorally support candidates we then have a team of 30 uh, out in india who are on the same time zone as the candidates when they are initially uh, coming to the uk so via themselves and our, our team in the uk we're able to support provide upwards of 20 hours of support for each of our candidates a day during this process that handholding is essential to not only allow trust to recruit en masse, but allow candidates to arrive and have the best possible welcome to the NHS, which is demonstrated in the retention of the candidates that Mid Yorkshire and some of our other partners have had by looking after the candidates. It is at the core of what Remedium do, it is what we've won awards on, um, and it, we invest heavily to, to ensure that that is passed on to the clients that we're privileged to work with as well. Um, so yeah, that is, um, there is also an on-site element. So myself and, and my team are physically on-site with the medical staff in teams at Mid Yorkshire on a weekly basis. And that continues long into the journey of the candidates. We are of the mindset that pastoral support does not end when a candidate works their first day in post. Um, we stay with um, Mid Yorkshire's candidates three, six, nine months in post until that lovely point where they say, um, medium, I'm OK now. Uh, the job is going well. The children are in school. We're in our accommodation. You really uh, can, can, you know, let me fly now. Yeah, leave so, us alone now, Ollie. <laughs> yeah, it, sometimes it is a, that simple. Um, so there's a question on how many consultants were successfully received through CESAR complete for consultant term posts at your trust. Ian, would you like to, to start on that one? Well, the, the project's not been in place long enough to say that we've had a, 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 a anything like a useful number to answer the first part of your question. Uh, what we do is we support people into the CESA program. Um, uh, if you're involved in it in your own areas, it, it's quite a complicated, very, uh, very different by different specialties. So uh, we're at the stage of investing time into formalizing uh, our support for CESA in multiple specialties. And that's a that's a whole different lecture and a whole different uh, our MyDoc program that, that is something that evolved out of these trips, but wasn't part of these trips. So it's, it's a new concept and a new idea that we've got. Um, but in terms of ED, they are they've always been really supportive and they've had uh, half a dozen people going through the uh, the uh, CESA uh, route. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm going to be a little cautious about giving you an actual number there because I, I honestly don't know. I have a feeling they've had a couple uh, succeed, but I'm just not certain where those people are at uh, at the precise moment in time. But none of the people that we've brought through on our system uh, on the this, these two trips have seized yet. They will. Uh, so that's why I can't ask that first question. Now, the second part, you, there's, there's other parts of your question. Oh, scrolling up. Um, uh, as to the ST4s, uh, we assessed people who came to talk to us uh, at the uh, interviews. And by being in the room, we were able to uh, say, well, that person would allocate to this level on a rotor. So we could take some of the people that had come in for quite junior posts and put them up onto the old money registrar rotors. Um, and I did that in the room with specialty leads. And we had others who'd come at senior level that we thought they're just not going to cope at registrar level. Would they be interested in a um, an SHO post. And we did that a few times. Um, we had, a, you know, some people who came for consultant interviews and we thought, well, they wouldn't manage. But then again, that was part of the advantage of being in the room. We could have those discussions. And I had those with people. Ollie had those with, with people and uh, your, your other colleagues had that. And to get the match to the right post, because um, they were as questioning as anybody once they got into the idea that they could have a dialogue with us. Uh, but yeah, the other, the last, so, you know, we made the fit to where they would be on our rotors, and I'm sure you'll be used to the idea that a registrar in your trust might be asked to do things at a slightly different level to a registrar in our trust, depending on the specialty, just because of the nature of what we see. Uh, but it will be very specialty dependent. Um, uh, yes, they spent uh, three months supernumerary um, is, is part of the deal. Um, and again, depending on the specialty, um, some of that supernumerary can be pretty hands on. Um, and we, we're very good in the specialties we picked. We're very good at making sure people are if they're hands-on, they're still very, very closely supported. Thank you. Um, can I ask what your locum spent? I'll just point out, sorry, before I continue with the questions, it has passed six o'clock. Personally, I'm happy and able to continue answering questions. If, if people do need to go, of course, please do. Um, I'll carry on. Um, so Julia asked, can I ask what your locum spend went to after this recruitment drive? Uh, you can, and I'm going to claim the fifth again because I don't do the money. I just, as I said, we we, we were looking at that uh, uh, significant um, saving over the lifetime of the project of 14 million pounds. So the the idea is to eliminate the locum spend on those posts. So we're not eliminating all locum spend because we haven't eliminated all um, uh, all gaps in rotors. But where we have filled posts, that locum spend stops. But of course, there's still a spend in terms of uh, th those people's salary over the two to three years that they're with us. I think, what did I say? I worked out that they would have, we spend nine million pounds in salary on those people, whereas we were spending, oh, I've lost the numbers oh, now, no. but uh, 12 and a half million on locums. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, during the life, during the period that they're with us, there's a, there's a gap there, but I'd, I'd need a proper manager to, to uh, help me with that one. But we are perfectly happy if you wanted to uh, send a note via Ollie. Um, he'll pass it on to Ian Carr and um, we can connect you and uh, my operational manager who understands the checks yeah. and beats his head against the wall whenever I try to answer a question about money. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's a question from Danielle. Um, that's a very simple one. Um, do you offer GMC sponsorship? Um, so the candidates that were medium pre-screened for this had their GMC registration in process. At a minimum, they were at the EPIC verification um, stage, but the majority, vast majority of candidates had their full GMC registration in place. The only exception to that is in certain specialties such as emergency medicine, Mid-Yorkshire in particular are partial to using what's known as the structured English language reference uh, process where they have trusted um, Remedium to outsource the language proficiency testing required for GMC registration. They prefer to do that when we are doing these projects because they are also physically present for those examinations. Um, and that is the method that emergency medicine in particular, um, not just at Mid-Yorkshire, multiple trusts have used with Remedium on these projects to secure a very competitive area of the market. So that is something we're able to do but um, GMC registration um, is part of the prerequisite for a candidate um, taking part in the, in the project. Ian, did you have anything to add on that? 
I don't think so. I, I, no, I don't think so. I think the, you know, I, I did highlight that the, the pre-screening was such a, um, a, an important part of it. Um, an observation, again, I, I keep emphasizing, I'm not in Remedium's employ. I'm just in, an enthusiast for the model that um, uh, we, we developed between us. Um, I get an extraordinary number of um, uh, agencies coming to me saying, we can place such and such a person with you. I'm sure you do too. Um, and I get a lot of pressure from my operational colleagues saying this agency has got all of us. They've got 10 people they can bring in tomorrow. Uh, and we, we're suspicious because almost invariably when we investigate it, those people don't have registration. They don't have residency. They can't move. The big difference here and whichever agency you might move with in the future, the big difference with this is all of those checks were done. So we interviewed people who were ready to move or as near as ready to move as makes no difference. That was really important. Yeah. Um, so what were your average onboarding times? So that kind of leads on from what Ian was saying in terms of that stringent um, pre-qualification of candidates. It's also grade dependent. So you will have um, what we would term ST12 level, SHO level candidates who have a month notice period or sometimes have hand tendered their resignation and are ready to come almost immediately. Um, so they can be in post as quick as four weeks. Um, the ST3 plus bracket of candidates, so all the way through to specialist and consultant level, will typically have a three month notice period. We uh, would get the majority of our work done in parallel to that notice period, bolt on um, two or three weeks for a candidate to tie up their affairs and you tend to get an average of four and a half months to five months uh, lead time from a candidate accepting a position from this process to being in post with you. There are exceptions to that. Our job as a supplier is to be completely transparent, um, particularly with the medical staffing teams who manage the waves of, of cohorts of candidates. But on average, um, four and a half to five months for ST3 plus doctors is what we've found over time. Um, would it possible, would possibly, so Julia has asked, would it be possible to save three million a year? Um, I would put my neck out and say the more vacancies you have, the greater the savings would be. Um, as Ian extrapolated, 150K could be saved um, from a single candidate going through to consultant level. Um, so you could divide that by three million um, to uh, define how many candidates you might have to place to save three million from an activity such as this. I, I, think, I think Julia's comment there was uh, into my offer to uh, connect Julia with Ian Carr. Um, okay. I, I'll I'll um, I'll let you do that on Friday after I've gone on holiday. Uh, no problem. He's, he's very approachable. Julia is a lovely fella, <laughs> but I'll still do it after I've gone on holiday. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have, um, I'm really sorry if I've missed any questions in the process there, but I think we have got to everyone who's asked a question at this point. We're a little over time, so I think it would be uh, best to, to, to wrap up there. Thank you everyone who has attended and partook in the questions. And Ian, just a massive thank you um, from ourselves at Remedium to you for, for sharing your insights and your time with us this evening. Take care everyone.